to align the transmission electron microscope operating remotely. So first I will try to show you the la the TM and uh, then we can go ahead. So this is the I think uh, most of the people yesterday you guys have visited the TM lab and this is the microscope and uh, using this axis we can operate this machine not only from here from anywhere in the from the world so we have control access of it and uh, here we can rotate everywhere and uh, we can check what is the values or what is this uh, thing but only thing what we can we can't do using this remote access is we cannot insert the sample so there we need some help someone needs to be there you know for inserting the sample apart from that most of the operations we can do remotely and uh, I just want to show you where exactly the vacuum levels are there this is the place where we need to check the vacuum configuration but um, Here, I, I don't think so. We can't see it properly, but anyway, it's it should be. Uh, uh, this is the indication of the gun. The very faint line here we can see. That's uh, it's less than about 1.2 into 10 to minus 5. So, whenever you are operating the microscope, once after inserting the sample, we need to check this one, and uh, it should the value should be less than 2 into 10 to minus 5, uh, for the reasons which I have mentioned earlier before lunch, because if the vacuum is not good in the gun region, it will start burning of the filament and uh, the lifetime will be re really reduced. So the first thing is before inserting or after inserting the sample, we need to check this uh, scale in such a way that it should be less than 2 into 10 to power minus 5. Here the, it is into 10 to power minus 5 and uh, here the, its middle is at 2 and somewhere here is 1. So it's less than uh, between 1 and 2. So it's 1.2 or 1.3 into 10 to minus 5. So that's really good. Next, uh, I'd like to show you the room. But of course, everyone have you guys have seen already the room. But um, it'll be a good idea to just to show the to the, uh, the capacity of this camera, because using this camera, it is very easy to navigate uh, entire room. And it's really very quite easy. So these are the insulated walls. And uh, if you go just further up, this is the air conditioning, controlled air conditioning, so that the, there is no erratic behavior of any airflow. Everything is really very controlled. And um, that's air conditioning for the vacuum system. Because uh, this room, it will become very hot uh, at certain times. So there is some kind of uh, air conditioning for that room as well. It's a small cabinet. I can't say it's a room. It's a cabinet. And uh, we can see the walls. Everything is insulated. And uh, one more thing I want to show you is the TM sample, where we place it. So if you see here, we normally place all the TM samples on the tools that were, we want to uh, use for changing the TM samples in a closed cabinet. Because if it's something exposed to the air, if something falls onto this O-rings, um, and if the O-rings go into the, um, as you know, the O-rings goes into the TM column, the vacuum can be contaminated. So everything is preserved properly, cleanly. And uh, we expect the users to do the same thing. when. When they finish the sessions, we ask all the users to remind the uh, leave the space really clean and tidy. And um, I think uh, I need to show you guys the vacuum system as well.
this is the one. This is the vacuum uh, generator from uh, air conditioning. From here, we get the really controlled air, con air, air flow to the room. And um, as yesterday, someone ha would have mentioned that um, the only 0.1 degree centigrade can be increased in one hour time. So at max, if you want to increase the temperature of the room, we need to wait for 24 hours for increasing by one degree centigrade. So it's really very controlled environment. And a uh, few more things that I haven't shown in my, uh, in my talk are this tilting. Uh, uh, we normally tilt the sample using these pedals here that are provided uh, for one side x, uh, plus and minus x in the x direction, y direction plus and minus. And um, below underneath, this is a GIF camera. So this, this uh, TM has got uh, two cameras, one on the top and one in the bottom. The top camera is located here. I believe too much of contrast. I will reduce the contrast. So. Okay. This is the camera. This is the top camera. Now I will be using this camera for doing uh, all the alignment process. And of course, we can use uh, this camera. This is called a Gathan Imaging Filter. Using this, we are able to filter uh, electrons of certain um, energy levels. And we can do uh, perform yields and uh, energy filtering TM. So it's really very interesting. Uh, and uh, I believe you'll be see, uh, seeing more about, uh, about the, those techniques in this week or next week as well. Uh, so let's go to the presentation. And uh, okay. So this is the building layout. Uh, this building is built. I mean, this is the layout of this electron microscope laboratory. As uh, for avoiding the vibrations, uh, this building was built on what is the technique? Um, building in building technique. So. So one building is placed in another building. So it's for reducing the uh, vibrations, uh, acoustic and uh, mechanical vibrations. Uh, while constructing this building, they have used that uh, technique. So it's one big building. And again, one more building, one building, one building. So it's building in building technique. It's the uh, construction was done. And uh, as yesterday, uh, Jefferson has mentioned, each block is really uh, about seven meters depth. They have digged the blocks and one concrete block of about uh, 10 meters or something like that they put. And uh, so, you know, maximum they try to reduce the uh, vibrations. So this um, laboratory is really very good for doing a high resolution microscopy. And next, what else we can do? What are the things we, we, that we can do using this uh, 2100 FEG TM? It's a, it does got a FEG, FEG, uh, FEG filament. So we, we can expect a really good uh, energy dispersion, means maybe 0 0.9 or 1 eV. And it, does, it can be operated both in TM and STEM modes. And as I said, it has got two cameras, one in the top, that's ES500W, one in the bottom, that's the Gathan imaging filter. As we can be able to do this in STEM mode, uh, as we can operate this machine in STEM mode, we can do bright field imaging, analog dark field imaging, and we have, um, two sets of high angle analog dark field EMF detectors. So one from GeoL and other from Gethan. And uh, recently we replaced this EDS with a solid state detectors. So it's much sensitive and really very good. And of course we can do EELS as well with a really good resolution. And uh, these are the, uh, some of the images that we acquired. So this is from uh, um, bright field image, dark field image and atomic resolution imaging, and uh, these are the maps that we can expect from, we can obtain from using this microscope. And uh, in the morning, I was telling you that uh, we can divide the entire microscope into different components. This is the electron source, and I believe I can, if I show you the, where exactly it is located. So from here to here, this is the enter bit is uh, electron source, that's an electron gun. And uh, 
Next, it has got many electromagnetic lenses. Of course, uh, in this TM, everything is covered, so we can't see. <laughs> but everything uh, here, it's the electromagnetic lenses inside, uh, just below the gun, one in the, just below the gun, and uh, for the condenser aperture, condenser lenses, objective lenses, and then uh, intermediate lenses and projection lenses. All of them are electromagnetic lenses. And vacuum system, I believe I have shown you, it's in the corner of the room. It's, uh, it's exactly, it's placed back of the, behind the column. And um, electron detectors, electron detectors again, uh, I need to show you here. So here we have one detector here. That's a camera, top camera. And here we have the fluorescent screen. And for just above the fluorescent screen, we have a small screen, maybe for seeing, uh, quickly seeing for small particles uh, in, the, in, in the screen as well itself. And, and also we can use that screen for alignment also. And a uh, few detectors, we have this one. This one. This is a GIF camera. So uh, I can't show you the TM sample. Just coming here, I have inserted the sample. So maybe the guys who are working in the third week, they will be knowing how to insert the samples. But uh, other people, I'm sorry, I can't show you. But anyway, I can show where exactly I put the sample. So this is a place uh, where we insert the sample. And uh, it's inside. We lock the, the, um, the cabinet because if it is open, it can be some, have some um, uh, vibrations. So just to be really stable enough, it's been locked inside. And uh, I have inserted double tilt holder. So double tilt means I can um, do uh, uh, tilt the sample in x and y directions, which is exactly this one. And uh, this is the process how we need to insert the sample into the column. So it's a kind of two-step process. First step is this one, and second step is this one. First, we need to insert the sample in, and uh, we need to wait for a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes or something like that. Once the because when the sample uh, holder is outside the column. It's atmospheric pressure. Where, so we need to increase the, well, after inserting the sample holder, the, uh, the, the, there needs to be really low vacuum, no, low pressure. So first we insert the sample and we pump, uh, start pumping. It takes five minutes or something like that. Then once the vacuum is built up in the column, so, so in the range of 10 power minus four or five, then the vacuum will be pulling the holder inside in. So during that time, we should be very careful when inserting the sample. That is the place where new users of the TM feel really very hard. So generally, we give training for them, uh, some, also some tips, how to hold the sample when you're inserting into, into the column. And uh, once uh, that is the main place where a new TM user can break something. So if you are able to insert the sample holder into the column, I feel everything is, you know, kind of, uh, nowadays the computers are, everything is computer controlled. So the damage which a new user can do is really very low. So now I have inserted the sample into the column. And uh, as, as you know, I mentioned that uh, I divided the entire column into different deflection units. So I uh, replaced the electron gun with the same and I replaced the condenser, upper, uh, condenser lens system as a deflector system, deflector unit one, and a condenser lens as a one single lens, and a condenser aperture which goes here, and uh, uh, below the lenses below the condenser lens, I uh, modified it as a deflection unit two, and here we get the uh, condenser lens, and uh, below that we have the 
projection lens and uh, intermediate lenses. I made it as a deflection unit 3 and I replaced one lens that is a projection lens and a complete unit, observation unit as one single line as a screen. So now we'll start doing the alignment process. As I said, it, uh, we can do the alignment process in five steps. So first step is we'll try to align the condenser aperture alignment, that's a C2 aperture. So it's the first uh, alignment step which we need to do it. And uh, I think I have mentioned you the, about the C1 and C2 lenses. And uh, if you have observed yesterday, there in the TM room we have uh, two screens. One is for operating the, this one. This is a software which we use for uh, acquiring the images. This is called a digital micrograph. It's really um, almost everywhere in the world they use this software. So this is really very popular software. And uh, we have one more communications, uh, we have one more computer screen. I will try to show you how it exactly looks here. Here, uh, the, this, is, this screen is located on the left side of the column in the real TM. Here, in, from this uh, screen, we can see what is the spot size we set, what is the alpha angle we set. So, okay. so but when the, here we said, the, uh, I said that C1 indicates the spot size, C2 indicates the uh, uh, illumination conditions. That is, uh, you know, we need a parallel beam or a focused spot. So uh, here, I said that uh, we have the spot size one. Spot size one is the biggest spot. And uh, if it is a spot size five, that's the smallest spot. And here, alpha is set to three. Uh, alpha is a kind of, uh, Geol, uh, it's a, the maker, the name, maker of this TM is a Geol microscope. Uh, it's a company defined value of uh, convergence angles. When you're in TM mode, we have three different convergence angles. That's uh, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. And uh, mainly alpha three is for, we get a really very parallel beam. Uh, not really parallel, something like this. But when you're in alpha one, it's something like this. It's really more parallel. It's not really more parallel. I mean, it's very parallel here. It's not really more parallel here. So it's a kind of like this. So when, when I'm operating the machine, I will show you, I can't, I can't show you this one because I will be operating here. For doing this remote access, I need to operate three computers at a time because I have a fast TM here, but this is not used for users. Normally users normally use I will show you. So normally users use control panel. This is the column and it's placed left side of the control panel. So it's called a left control panel. And uh, where is one more? This one is placed right side of the column, so it's called the right control panel. Using these two uh, panels, normally users align the machine. Um, I try to uh, operate from here and uh, try to align the machine now. So starting with the alignment. First thing is I need to switch on the emission. So I will Using this computer here, I will, uh, emission HP status is on and emission is on. Everything is uh, already set to 200 kV. Now I will try to open the beam. It's really very simple in case of FEG machine, but if you're operating using the MSC, it's a, we have other GOL 2100 machine. It's a lab six filament. So we need to gradually, slowly increase the he, uh, heat and uh, we need to start heating the filament, then only we can expect a filament uh, emission. But here, it's straight away, just click the open button, we get the beam. It's really very easy. So I click the bar, uh, open button. Mm. 
now now i have the beam opened i want to see it i have inserted the camera already so here is the camera i have options for selecting two different cameras one is gif and the other one is a es finder w and uh, i have selected it so yeah so that's okay uh, it's not really very good because and uh, when you're operating in this way you need to be really very careful about the camera because it's a fake filament so it's really very intense and um, all, always not only now when you're working on the tm also you should be very careful with the intensity because it can easily burn the ccd camera once the ccd camera is burnt that's it you can't do anything you need to replace it and it's really expensive so be careful and uh, when you're using the my, my machine just be careful we can't put lot of intensity on the ccd camera so it's not really very it's not very good because we haven't inserted any aperture here just i switched on the filament uh, emission so now i will try to insert the aperture and uh, i can do the uh, that insertion using this computer here and uh, So yeah, here we have options for different apertures. Now the CLA condenser lens aperture is set to open. I will start with using as a size two, so that should be fine. Now the aperture aperture is inserted, and uh, of course, <laughs> it's really very good aligned. So <laughs> what I try to do is. i will try to misalign the uh, aperture and i will show you how how the uh, you know i'll try to show you guys this effect if the aperture is misaligned how it will be like this so for doing that normally i need to go here and uh, okay i need to see the image but uh, <laughs> so it's a kind of misaligned now now if i change the current in in the deflection unit 2 that's uh, using the brightness knob you see it's not concentric in nature it's oobling it's increasing that side and it's increasing in the other direction but when it is exactly aligned when you change the current in the deflection unit 2 the the change in the current should be the the contraction and extraction of the circle needs to be in the exactly in the square so i will try to correct it for correcting it here i have shown that first i tilted the beam to a center of optic axis so i try to make now here now you should be careful here because if i concentrate the beam to a small spot there is a lot of concentration and it's easily we can burn the camera so i will be little bit careful about it and uh, here for i mean uh, when you are working on the tm we have a black region for indicating the where is the center of the optic axis but as we are on the ccd detector uh, we don't have it so maybe i will try to draw a line for understanding the center of the optic axis cent optical cent optic axis center something like that this is the center of the optic axis now i concentrate the beam it's really very far so 
it's something like this. I need to move it to the optic axis. And for doing that, I use the beam tilt. Something there. It's in the center of the optic axis. Maybe if I reduce it further, it's not. I will correct it. So that's the center. Now it's obling, but it's not in the center now. So now I will try to make it in the, look like in the center. So I try to bring it in the center by changing the aperture position on this other, other computer here by using this knobs position. So I focus the beam again and see if it is in the center. I think it's in the pretty much in the center. So now I open it. It's not exactly in the center yet. So I will try to move it a little bit more. So now I believe it is in the center, nearly in the center. So that should be fine. I will check whether the still, when we focus the beam, it is in the, on the still on the optic axis or not. And uh, so it's nearly there, but make it perfect. So that's it. That's good. So now if we change the excitation current in deflection unit two, it is it starts obling just in the concentric manner. Just the way it's shown here. It's obl in this concentric manner along the optic axis. So once when you see this effect, we can be confirm that condenser aperture alignment is performed. So moving on to the next one. Here, I <clears throat> for give a, for a, I have given some details about how to how we can set the illumination condition. As I said, TM has got three setups: one, two, three. Especially if you're going for higher magnification, normally uh, it's uh, one is preferred. Alpha set, alpha values. These are uh, alpha one is preferred for higher magnification, but uh, if you're going for less than uh, 500k, three should be good. And of course, we have different uh, alpha valves for different modes, such as EDS, NBD, and CBD as well. But now, today, we'll be working only on uh, uh, TM mode. So next, next alignment step is electron gun alignment. Uh, during my talk uh, in the morning, I said this slide is prepared for a lab six filament. So when you're doing for, when you're working for the FEG mission, it's a little bit, little bit different. So how we do it is, we center the anode. So and we do, it's in two steps, gun tilt and gun shift. Okay. We do it in uh, two steps, gun tilt and gun shift. So now, and always, uh, please be remember that try to do all the alignments on a vacuum region where there is no sample because that's the place. But only one step, that's uh, when you're correcting for the objective lens astigmatism, it's preferred to do on a amorphous region. But um, <coughs> 
again here for uh, first I will try to do the gun tilt here I use this gun tilt for gun button for, for deflecting unit gun and uh, anode obler and I try to uh, miss what exactly I'm doing is I'm just changing the acceleration current in the gun and uh, obling anode and make sure the uh, obel is in the along the optic axis if it is not in the optic axis then I need to align the machine so I try to click obel anode something there it's not really very good so I try to align it So I try to kind of align it using the gun, uh, the excitation current in gun and anode. So now it's in the other direction. That's not good. So I reduce it. So it's in the kind of straight. One at a time. We have two knobs here, one, uh, x and y action, uh, direction. So I believe that that's good. It's oscillating exactly in the, along the optic axis. So when you're happy with that, you can take off the oval effect. Now, after finish of your, when you're happy with this gun tilt, we can do the gun shift. Here, uh, doing the gun shift alignment, it's a kind of cyclic process. Means uh, here, gun shift center the beams at different spot sizes. Uh, I change means. I go for a smallest spot size. No, first I go for a bigger spot size. I center it to optic axis. I increase, I increase the spot size to five. That's the smallest spot. And I, again, I center it. And when I come back to one again, if there is any shift in the focus point, then I correct it using the gun shift. So for changing the spot size, I use this computer here. Uh, here is the spot size one. Here, using this, I can change the spot size here. Uh, first of all, I need to put the, it's in the center of, of optic axis. So, something there, it's nearly there, I guess. Okay, so it's in the center. Now, I go to spot size five. So now the spot size is five. Spot size number five means uh, it's the smallest spot. And uh, when I change to the spot size five, you can see that the central beam has been moved. So I try to, I don't do anything else, just centering the focus spot to the center of optic axis. Now it's in the center because normally when you're working on the TM machine, we focus this spot not this big. We focus only this size. It's really very small, but I'm afraid if I put the, that such a small spot, it can easily burn the detector. So I don't want to take any of those risks. So I put a little bit bigger spot here. Now I go back to spot size one. Of course, I'm using this computer here now. So now there is a shift. So I need to sh uh, correct this shift using the gun shift. So it's in the center now. I check cyclically by changing from, again, back to spot size five. And if there is any shift or not.
yes there is shift so I try to correct it using again back go back to one again still there is so I need to correct it So I check it again, you need to do a couple of times, yes there is some small bit shift. So it's nearly there. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it's nearly there and it's there, but so it should be fine. But uh, obviously, when you're working on the real TM, this we can make the spot much smaller, and we can see the difference much precisely. But of course, I can't uh, due to the restriction of this burning the CCD camera. I can't much. Uh, I can't make this uh, focusing spot much smaller than this. But now it's good. So next, after finishing this, I need to check for the condenser astigmatism correction. And uh, again, I mentioned the, about this slide. This slide was prepared for uh, the images that were shown in this uh, slide were taken from lab 6 filament. So the shape of the circle is the source filament shape is circular in nature. But if you're when you're working on the FEG machine, the shape is not circular, it's a kind of equilateral triangle. I will show you how to do, uh, do that. So for seeing the source, I need to go for a really very high magnification. So now I'm at a 50k I will try to increase the magnification to 1.5k. And um, when you are changing the magnification, oops, when I'm changing the magnification, it's very easy that the beam will be going off from the center because I mentioned that when I'm explaining the nature of electrons in the magnetic field, it starts uh, going, it goes spiral in nature. So when I change the magnification, it's very common that the central spot moves away from the optic axis. So I need to be careful when I'm changing the magnification. So if you see here, now I'm at 120K. Already the beam is not in the center, I believe. So you see, when I was in 50K, it was here, somewhere here. When I changed the uh, magnification to 120K, the beam has been moved. This is due to the spiral nature of the, spherical nature of the electron beam in a magnetic field. So now I change, increase the magnification again further. So when I move the, make it smaller. Now I'm at 200K, the beam is being further away from the optic axis. If I increase it further, you see, it's going away from the optic axis. So 
So I need to correct that one. I need to central it, centralize it. So using the beam shift, I put it back onto the optic axis. So now the magnification is 1 million, 1.5. So, so now the magnification is 1.5 million times. So when you are in a, this much high magnification, it's really very high. Uh, whatever the disturbances, if you are in a room and if you make any small noises, it's very easy to see on the screen. But now as the microscope is operating remotely, it's really good. We don't see that kind of effects. So always recommended thing is to uh, uh, operate the microscope remotely, but for not for this microscope, maybe for the new microscope which we are getting. So uh, it's, it's really very good. <laughs> it's really a kind of equilateral triangle. I will try to show how, how an uh, uh, astigmatic beam looks like by making it bad. So consonance. So if the beam is something like that, it's highly astigmatic in nature. So we need to correct it. And normally we are now, I, what I'm doing is, I'm correcting this uh, astigmatism using a stigmatus. It's a small octopal lens. It's built into the TM and I'm trying to correct it. Now we can see it's a kind of good equilateral triangle kind of thing. If I focus a little bit further. But Somewhere there. So that's good. So there we can see it's a kind of equilateral. So that's the uh, image of the source. Now, when you're happy with this, we can go back to the lower resolution magnification. It's moved from the center, so I try to correct it. So now, okay. once after finishing that thing, you can look further and try to, for the next step is setting the eccentric height. This is really very important because uh, we need to check this eccentric height very often. When I say often means whenever you peel the sample or when you change the magnification, whenever the, whichever the case, you need to check for uh, eccentric height. Uh, as I said, what is a eccentric height means when the sample is at eccentric height, if you do any tilting or uh, any tilt operation, it doesn't move. When in the case A, when we tilt the sample, the image moves and it doesn't see in the optic axis. But when, the, when the, here in B, the, here the sample is in eccentric height, so when we tilt the sample in this direction, the here or here, always it will be in the same orientation. Now, I mean, it doesn't change; uh, it stays along the optic axis. So that indicates this is in the optic uh, eccentric height. Next, how exactly we do it on the TM? So we have two different ways. One is coarse adjustment, and the other one is fine adjustment. I try to show you how to do it. And uh, we normally do this on a TM sample. 
on the sample region and I believe I haven't spoken anything about the this sample. Uh, this sample is a silicon silicon germanium uh, super lattice structure. Uh, this is a standard sample. This sample is mainly used for calibration purpose. And we can see these are the silicon silicon germanium layers. So um, as silicon germanium has got a uh, higher concentration, it appears darker in the image. So one, two, three, four, five. It's a five set, five, one, two, three, four. Four, one, two, three, four. These are the multi layers of silicon and silicon germanium. And uh, normally this sample is used for calibrating the TM, uh, magnification calibration. And uh, here, of course, the sample is in eucentric height. I try to make bad and I will show you the first I need to show you guys the course adjustment change the object to learn distance by altering the z height and again I try to adjust the z height using this controller here Now we see it's really bad. It's a something like a, here. It's an O focused. So we see a black line here. So it's a very, very dark. Oh, it's in the well, under focus, sorry. Under focus. And you see here a darker line, it's an over focus. So when you're in focus, the contrast should be minimum. So just by looking at the image, I can say that this is a in focus case because the contrast is minimum compared to, this is a no sample region, this is a sample region. So the contrast is really very minimum. If I go further above or below, I see the contrast here more higher compared to here. So something like this, it's, the contrast is really very uniform here and here, but uh, in the under focus or over focus, I see a greater contrast here compared to here. So I did the course adjustment. For doing a fine adjustment, I mentioned that uh, uh, using use an image obler and minimize the movement using the Z controls. So I see the, uh, I obel the image by image controls. So now you see the image is more obling. Or, okay, <laughs> it's really very good. Now we can see the effect. It's really very bad. It's moving. I need to reduce that movement by changing the height. Because uh, so that's no movement or really very low movement. If I go further, it starts oval again. That's bad. So I need to correct it. So there is no. So now there is very low moment. So that's it. So that's uh, now I switch off the, uh, we have two options for obling. We have image X and image Y means uh, we can obel the image in X direction or Y direction, two different directions. And uh, we can use whichever one we want. It doesn't matter. <coughs> so next after finishing this pivotal point, Again, this is really very important, but I'm afraid uh, I can't show you guys this 
uh, alignment properly, but I will try my best to show you uh, this one. Again, I will try to do it on the vacuum. The reason why I can't show you properly is I need to, for uh, observing that movement, I need to focus the beam to a small spot and uh, I need to observe the movement in the spot by using the beam tilt. So I will, I'll show you what exactly I mean. Here I have a compensator for tilt. I use this one and when I wobble in X or Y direction, I see the movement. If I see the movement, I need to correct it. Otherwise, it's good. The pivotal point is already set. So I can't put it like that because it's too intense. The value is coming around. It's 3,700. So I can easily burn the camera. So I don't want to put that much of intensity on the CCD. So somewhere there. And uh, I use the tilt compensator. It's good. That, um, yeah, it's nice. But. Uh, maybe at least I will try to make it bad and um, try to correct it again. But Because when the size of the beam is this much, it's very hard to see the, any change in the beam. Maybe now we can see, some, I can't do it again, okay. So now the beam is obling. So it's not really very high level, but if I make it bad, Now, it's the pivotal point is not good because you see the oval properly. I need to, uh, by changing the current across the compensator, I need to correct this oval. Now, I have eliminated all the movement. So that indicates my pivotal point is, is set. So in this way, we need to do it. Once when, you're, when the beam is not moving, you can take off the oval uh, tiltex and compensator. Next, once when we are happy, here I have shown some particle and we need to stop the particle movement and uh, by changing the tilt uh, compensation. But the sample which I have used here is a wafer sample. So I don't have any nanoparticles on the sample, so I need to use it in this way only. So this is the way how I correct the tilt, and if uh, of course we need to do it in both imaging and diffraction. But diffraction, if you correct in imaging most of the time, it will be it should be fine, and uh, use the tilt and tilt x and y for imaging. Once after finishing that, this is the rotation center alignment. And uh, this step is really, really very important. Uh, you need to take a lot of care for this step and uh, asymptotic height. Especially uh, if you change the magnification, these two steps can change. So you need to be really very extra, uh, you need to pay extra caution for doing this alignment. So how I did here is just when the image is not in the, or when the, this particle is not in the optic axis. When I change the voltage, it starts wobbling randomly, something, it doesn't wobble along the optic axis. So, but when we sort out this correction, after performing this 
uh, alignment process. It's uh, like a pin and it starts over in one direction only. So you need to do something like that. And how we can do it? We can use either current centering or uh, voltage centering. And uh, we can try to do it using voltage centering for the demo. So here is my beam. Okay, that's good. And uh, uh, I mentioned that in the presentation that we need to oval the high tension and make the center of the uh, and make sure the center of the image stays in the in the same place. So for performing the oval across the high voltage, I need to use here this computer for obling across. The high tension is a high HT. HT means high tension. So something uh, oval that side. So I need to correct it. I So I will try to correct and make sure that it's the oval is along the optic axis. So now it's oval in this direction. So that is wrong. I need to go in the other direction. So now it's going in this direction. So that's wrong as well. I need to come into the middle. So now it's in the x direction. I used one key. Uh, to uh, how to, uh, here option for using x and y i have used x direction x seems to be okay but i feel it is more over more in this direction so i try to correct y as well so if i go further in the y direction it's very bad so i go back now again it's really bad in but in the other direction of y so i try i can try to come to the center point so something it's oval in the along the if you consider this is an optic axis it's obeling in the center of optic axis so now it's fine when you're happy with that we can take off the oval so that concludes the rotation centering alignment of course one more step is there. This is objective lens astigmatism. Uh, this is this is very easy to perform on a amorphous region, but I'm afraid the, uh, this sample doesn't have amorphous because it's prepared using a. Uh, I will show you that one. But I will try to do it the, on the amorphous region of the sample, but I believe I can't do it because the amorphous region is really very low for the sample. That's a sample, and uh, you see this fine line. This is the glue line, where I can expect a, some small, some sort of amorphous region because it's a glue. Glue is a amorphous material, so there I can I need to perform this uh, alignment. So I believe it's a bit hard, but if I can't do this one on this sample, next session. Uh, Erico will be working on a pure good amorphous region, amorphous sample, I mean, uh, nanoparticle sample. There you can expect a lot of amorphous region because it's been the nanoparticles are placed on uh, carbon film. So carbon is a amorphous. So uh, there it's easy to un uh, observe this effect properly. But now I've, as I have some bit of time, I will try to do the here.
the tilt, uh, moving the sample, you should be really very careful, uh, especially when you're at a higher magnification. When you move the sample, it will go very easily, or it can drift a lot. So you should be careful about that. So for doing this, um, uh, correcting this objective lens astigmatism, we need to use a fast Fourier transform of the image. So let's say fast Fourier transform, but uh, <laughs> it's not really very good uh, because of lack of amorphous region, but I will try. Something I got, but it's not good. Good enough. You see, kind of circular enough because it's, uh, the amorphous region is really very low. I can't see this properly, but if there is, uh, if there is a good bit of amorphous region, I can I could have seen something like this in an uh, astigmatic objective aperture. So I need to use the uh, do the objective of astigmatism and try to make sure the this. Uh, fringes, these are Fresnel fringes, make sure uh, they appear as circular, as circular as possible and it's really very easy uh, step, so no, nothing to worry too much. And in general, if someone uh, has corrected it, it will remain for good, uh, long enough, means maybe for uh, one month or something like that, it, it can be good enough. So. So now, after finishing this, before finishing this uh, demo, uh, demo session, I would like to give some uh, few words of ca uh, caution. Uh, I want to stop this one actually because. So first, always handle the sample holder with gloves and thoroughly clean them using uh, tweezers. That's the reason uh, when we are training us new users in our laboratory. We ask them to use the gloves, and uh, uh, maybe when the guys who are you know, working on the, in the during the third week, you'll be seeing how we train the people. We recommend the people, uh, the guys, to use gloves and uh, use the optical microscope to take off all the lint or, or any other material on the O-rings, uh, so so that the O-rings are really clean and really very good. And uh, also, when you're handling your samples, you should be really very careful. Because if there is something wrong with your sample, um, it, will, it can contaminate uh, entire column as well. So you should be careful. Next, follow standard procedure while inserting and removing the sample holders for maintaining good vacuum in the TM. As I said, this is a place where new TM users can make some uh, mistakes. So that's why we train people, uh, we spend a lot of time with the new users uh, so that they get expert, uh, good experience in how to insert the sample and take away the sample. So, and also it's, uh, if you have the experience for three or four times uh, repeat it, it should be easy, but uh, in the first, it's always, it's really a bit critical. And be careful while handling the uh, TM samples. Um, if, the, if you spend around, uh, means obviously, if you're preparing some met, uh, material science samples, you need to uh, invest a lot of uh, effort in preparing them. And if you're careless in handling your TM samples, it can easily break off because the membrane or, or the electron transparent region in the TM samples is around uh, zero to 100 nanometers. So if you're really neglect, neglect means if, you, if you're not really very vigilant enough, it can easily break off. So you should be really very careful when you're handling the TM samples. Due to that, in our lab, we use the vacuum tweezers for lifting the samples because if you are using a normal tweezer, 
it's very easy to bend the TM grids. So if you are using a uh, vacuum freezer, it's really very easy to pick and put it onto the TM grid and take off and put it back into your, st uh, your st uh, storage boxes. Next, always take care of the CCD camera. Stronger intensity of electron beam can easily damage the CCD. This one, especially if you're doing uh, electron diffraction, maybe in the next demo, I can show you how strong the transmitted beam can be and how easily it is to uh, damage the CCD. Uh, especially when you're working on the system, always we need to block the central beam and we need to acquire the image. Or we have some other tips that you need to follow them for you know, pro uh, preventing the damage of the CCD. And uh, excess spillage of liquid nitrogen can crack the TM viewing screen or other equipment nearby. So of course, we need to, uh, when you start the TM session, you need to fill the liquid nitrogen into the column. But uh, we recommend we need, to, we need to fill the liquid nitrogen, but you should be careful that it, it can't overflow a lot. If it overflows a lot, it will fall onto the nearby equipment and it can break the equipment. So you should be careful about that. And uh, one more thing, minimize the acoustic noise while working on the TM. So be, uh, be, uh, don't make any noise or don't avoid talking when you're acquiring the images because it can have influence on your image, imaging. And um, of course, if you, have change, uh, if, you have, if you have changes in settings, return to the original setting when you finish your session. So for any, uh, someone want to do a diffraction or if, uh, for any other reason, they change the, any uh, alpha angle or spot size, you need to return back to the same uh, settings as in the be uh, beginning of your session because the user, the next user, it will be, uh, they don't know what you have did and so that uh, you need to leave the uh, room how it was in the beginning of your session. So I believe that's the thing and uh, so those are the words of caution and we have another 10 minutes or so and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Obler, yeah. Obler is changing the excitation current in particular lens. Obel, obel means obel means how it is done is you're exactly changing the excitation current in particular lens. That's it. Ah, uh, sorry. Um, you're changing the excitation current. I mean the current that flows into the lens means I said uh, when you change the current you're changing the magnetism, mag uh, electromagnetic, uh, uh, so you're changing the focal length. So Obel means you're changing the excitation current. Sorry? Yes, they are different. Actually, a stigmator is a, a simple electrostatic lens, but Obel, you're changing the excitation current. So they're two different. So I think there are no more questions. Thanks for the. Thanks. Okay.